Welcome back to all new three part drama How to Survive the Apocalypse by Cedric Suarez. An Arsenal podcast with Alexander Money Penny and my very good friends, Bradley Adams and president of Audacity Club. <laughs> Audacity. <laughs> Of Artist City Club, George V AFC. How you doing, boys? <laughs> Both on your phones. Yeah. Get off and look at you, millennial. I'm trying to get Gen fucking X, stats up for you, Alex. Get stats Fight up in me. your own time, Brad. In your own time. This is TDK time, baby. <laughs> TDK uh, time, baby. <laughs> uh, how are you both? Well, yes. not too yes. bad. Enjoying. It's actually not little, too hot uh... here, but as as the lovely YouTube members will complain about, the chest hair's still out. Yeah, so so can we address the chest hair complaints? If you don't watch on YouTube, there's been some there's been a lot <laughs> of comments just, about Brad's chest hair. They're just uncomfortable that they're sexually attracted to a man. That's all it is. That must be it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um before we continue, I do just want to plug something very quickly. So um on the different knock, uh you can get it on the memberships, so you can get it on the Patreon as well. Uh you can also sign up for free and then cancel. So, like, you can watch this for free, everyone. Um, so uh, we did an episode with John Harrison yesterday on goalkeeping. And John Harrison is a, a, a genius. He told me, <laughs> so he, he was saying, like, the reason he got into goalkeeping analysis and goalkeeper XG and all that sort of stuff is he was doing a um, he was doing a degree and then he did it at Cambridge. Then he did a PhD in astrophysics. And then he went, yeah. And then in my spare time, I was like, I'm going to stop you there. <laughs> what spare time? as a phd student at cambridge and then he went uh yeah we did this whole like 1v1 thing and i like did the analysis on it all in his own spare time they got picked up by goalkeeper xg it's such a cool story but anyway we talked about ramsdale and his 1v1 capacity and stuff i learned so much it's on there it's like a goalkeeping masterclass so go give that a watch uh if you're interested in that there's an audio uh, version available as well um so yeah just wanted to plug that um and secondly boys just had someone in my uh, in my ex replies, saying that Bakayo Saka has been awful, awful, as in for England in the last couple of games or for for Arsenal. Oh, uh, grow up! <laughs> that like, I listen. Listen, I respect the person on an individual level. Everyone has their right to an opinion. I don't. How if you're that <laughs> if you're that stupid, you deserve no respect. <laughs> But I will just try and find his reply. It was essentially, he said, uh, I, I was essentially saying that I think Fabio Vieira has earned a right to start against Everton, which we'll come to in a second. And he said, what about Saka? Do we not hold the same standards for all of our players? Saka has been awful the past few games. And I'm like, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> How has he been awful? He's had three goals and assists. He's had a young player of the year win. <laughs> He's had a Ballon d'Or nomination, and I appreciate those are slightly historical. But if this is awful, like, what's his actual level? I can't find the graphic, but I saw it um, a few days ago. It's on Twitter. I'm seeing if I can find it now. That it's about like how um, how creative are our players? The conversation was around Martin Erdegaard and the fact that he shoots more than he kind of takes that final pass. He's more of a final shot action type player mm -hmm. than a final pass action type player. And it had like the creative numbers for our team, right? And if, if like this is the axis, Martin Erdegaard's like down here and there's lots of players like down here and Kai Havertz is surprisingly like up here. But Kai Saka's mm -hmm. like fucking up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, it's, get as Arsenal fans, I know that all we used to be happy about was the transfer window and the new <laughs> signings FC, but stop it with your shiny new toy syndrome just because he's not scored in, we've played four Premier League game. What are we doing? He's also got he's got three goals and assists. I don't know what more you want. Like Fucking it's so hell. bizarre. I think that's a normal attack. George, what like what is it? Like, is it shiny new toy? Is it because I like I'm not just calling out this dude, like I'm sure he's a nice guy. But like I just find this this whole thing like I don't if there's one player that you can't go after, surely it's Saka. Or are we just are we protecting our Hayland boy? I... No, I, I don't think it's protection. I made a post about this on Twitter because I thought that the discourse was ridiculous. Like when you look at his numbers, he leads the team in every single metric. 
we've talked about this in the attacking, you know, sequences that, you know, Optus kind of recorded in terms of total passes, shots, and chances created. The guy's a phenom. He leads in every single metric. He does so on, uh, on an equivalent level in each area of the pitch. It's not one area of the pitch that he's excelling in. Mm. He's excelling in all phases. Then when you combine the production of three goals and assists in four games, I'm sorry, that's productive to me. Um, and broadly speaking... <laughs> I do think that the degree of his misses have painted a picture of what he's not. So what do I mean by that? Like the guilt edged open goal misses Mm. have meant people think he's poor, but every other part of the game he's been phenomenal in. Like I really just don't see this insistence on saying it and not even just creatively, but look at his defense, his defensive numbers, his recovery tackles being pushed wide and maintaining this level of creative hub is insane. It's incredible. And And so, and, and this, isn't where, that. this isn't this isn't necessarily where I wanted this to go, but I think it's naturally heading in this direction. I think sometimes when we feel things aren't going well, which you know I have issues with the team at the minute, but ultimately we are three wins from four. Like you know, and we're we're should be we're four drawing, wins from four. Should be four wins from four. We're looking at you know the same uh, uh, xG difference as City uh, versus I saw a graph earlier from the Athletic. We're in the same sort of ball camp as, as a city we're not miles off it i think what happens is sometimes everything comes up for debate in those sorts of it's like for example you know, you'd like we all remember the awful times under like you know brad like early doors different knock like those awful like you know Demari gray last minute winner against everton or like that creating game against... 0.27 xg from 75 crosses into the box <laughs> yeah that, that exactly yeah. side that that game that three nil again in lockdown football like we all remember that i get that <sighs> And sometimes I felt at the time that ev- everything comes up for debate. It's like, we need to get rid of this player, that player, this player. I'm like, okay, I-, I appreciate things are going wrong, but we have to try and compartmentalize. And in this case, when such a small margin's going wrong, we're still going, well, everything's up for debate, including Bukai Saka. And I'm like, that is crazy. There's, but- one, there's one parable I'd like to, and this, this might catch me some heat from the two of you on the podcast, right? In my opinion... If the Ballon d'Or was an award done for the best player... Is this a parable in... from the Bible, yeah? Oh, well, I mean, parable's <laughs> the wrong word, but it was the first word that came to my head. Um, Lionel Messi, since winning his first Ballon d'Or, should have won every single Ballon d'Or since. If the award is to do with who is the best player in the world in those current seasons. If you look at his numbers, no one was eclipsing him, right? But he became a victim of his own high standards and success in that season where he scored something like, or that year where he scored like 92 goals in a calendar year. Like you become a victim of your own success of the standards that you set yourself. If you ever before perform below those standards, you see players like Modric win a Ballon d'Or who with respect won it because of his country's decent performance in an eight game tournament when Messi performed incredibly well over an yeah, entire yeah. 12 months. And it's, it's this like it, Ronaldo should have a single Ballon d'Or, the one that he won at Man United. He never eclipsed Messi in terms of you, ability or in terms of numbers whilst he was in Spain. But like, there, there's, could, there's not, can, I think he, I think that season where Madrid got a hundred points, but apart from that, I do. Maybe. Yeah. Well. Apart from those, but then, but then it becomes about, okay, is that due to the team's success or is that due to the player's success? And the, and this is what I mean by like, you have to stop judging players by this incredibly high standard that they, that they might be able to set every other season or mm. occasionally in their career. But if, if Saka performs at three goals in every four games, what is that over a season? Three and four. Three GA. So yeah, that's you end up with basically you end up with twenty nine goals and assists over a course of a season. Yeah, yeah. And if that's awful, then then and what? I appreciate the point around like the all round play and contribution. But sorry, that's better than Eden Hazard ever. I'm pretty sure ever achieved in his Premier League career. I don't think he ever touched thirty goals and assists in the league yeah you make a rough that's yeah that's 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 that that is ronaldo numbers that is sanchez Mm. numbers that is like crazy crazy numbers to achieve in the premier league stop at 22 (laughs) yeah stop viewing it through the idea that unless this person is and we have we have been spoiled as a generation with messi with ronaldo with you know even with neymar and hazard and and Sanchez and all of these phenomenal players like the kid's 22 and he's performing at a level that if a player performed that when they were 28 29 and 30 they'd be written into folklore as probably one of the best players of a club's history yeah just yeah I I, I do Georgia I'll let you just 
come back before we move on. I just want to say, mm. obviously, this is one person's a bit. I'm not saying everyone thinks this, but I do. Th- I do think it's interesting that that it's come up because it's just like it's. And I've seen a few. You know, yes, I've seen this one person that spot, spot this, but I've seen it a number of times. People saying, "Well, Saka needs this, that, and the other," and I'm just, yeah. But yeah, your your final thoughts on that before we move on, George. I, I was talking about you with this earlier. You know, I just think that Twitter's become such a, um, you know, a contrarian debate X. space. Uh, oh, sorry, X. Oh, gosh, here we go. Um, but uh, I, I think international break brings these upon ourselves too. Like we sit yeah. there without football, we analyze every aspect of the team because we're not seeing them. Yeah. Um, I do think that there's definitely some validity to Saka starting slowly generally in seasons. Like I've seen that throughout his career, so I can appreciate that perspective. Mm. But I just think that some of the conclusions about him, A, um, being quite poor or those descriptions, and even for his standards, like I really struggle to understand those perspectives when you've got Mm. a guy that's leading metrics for your team that's consistently put the team first in terms of even his own stardom. And by the way, I will say, I don't think that we've even given him the superstar treatment that he's ever deserved. Like, I really think that this team needs to be built for him. And I think that we've used him to get us out of binds. Mm. And he's constantly the one to sacrifice his individual game because he's so good, because he's such a universal kind of Swiss army knife to to problems. And I just think that we, we do not give him the support that he needs. And that also goes for Martinelli, at least this season. But especially Saka I feel he's the first one to move and you know I think it was very telling by the way that in the last part of the United game when Jesus came on he moved to the left very Mm. consistently and you know I I like that that's him taking personal responsibility where he's like listen I'm I'm the MVP of this team or I'm an elite player in this team I'm not touching the ball I want it and he's taking Mm. it upon himself to create those solutions so Mm. I'm excited for that but on the whole discourse, yeah, I think it's odd to yeah. critique. Your I don't think this conversation that. happens because he's been doubled up on nearly every game. I don't think this conversation happens if we've been able to kind of um, exploit the central spaces that have been left due to the fact that teams are doubling up on our wingers. Yeah, I think it's because we look a certain way. I think I think also it doesn't happen not on the internet. <laughs> it's like I think match going fans don't think this at all. Um, so let's move on to the uh, international break. Um, there was a couple of interesting performances by Brad. Um, there was uh, Tommy Asu's performance. Obviously, there was a kind of comp going around uh, that people saw. I'm sure everyone saw uh, of Tommy Asu's performance at left centre back. We also saw Martin Erdegaard. Um, George, I'll start with you. Uh, it's always difficult to take too much from these international performances. What have you taken from this round, if anything? Is there a particular play that stood out to you? If there's a, if there a particular moment that stood out to you? I mean, I got um, a lot of my little galaxy brain theories here with some little tidbits, you know, in terms of Tommy Asu central center back performance. Um, one thing that I'm not a huge fan of, but one thing that we've seen in a lot of the fan discourse is seen as Zinchenko at left central midfield, playing well, scoring a goal. We've seen, um, you know, Martin Odegaard in terms of his performance. Maybe we can have a discussion about his transition as a player in terms of a lot of people thinking, and me included, that, you know, his skill set is more built towards a controller all face central midfielder but he's been a final action shoot on site uh, midfielder all season and for most parts of last season as well so the transition that he's had to make as a profile and then of course in this game again arriving in the left half space shooting across his body for a beautiful goal um, Kai Havertz with an excellent assist in the right half space Um, and uh, you know so we've we've seen players that have come in and, and made impacts for their team Gabriel I think as a center back was brilliant for Brazil certainly in the first game. Um, I don't know about the second game, but definitely had a really good, strong cameo from Martinelli, even in the second game as well. So Arsenal players are doing well. And it wasn't just, I think Ramsdale as well played pretty well for his um, his game. And I mean, we could start to talk about that discussion again if people want it with the distribution, because that came out to play. Um, again, where uh, a return to his ability um, came to the forefront. Uh, so there's a lot of good things in the sense that I think a, Arsenal are a team of internationals again, but also they're playing well within those internationals. So it's not just they're making up part of the squad. They're contributing actively to significant output and becoming leaders on their team. I think I saw a brilliant um, article just recently talking about Tommy Asu and how Japan view him as the leader of their defense. And mm. um, it goes beyond just the central center back shouts. It's more so that he's taking more responsibility in the team. And look, 
you love to see it because these boys are becoming men and they are boys. Like, let's have it right. Like the average age is still 23 and change in the squad. They are boys. And the fact that, you know, you're getting some more of these interviews about leadership and even Martin Odegaard saw an interview with him very recently, um, kind of cocky. And I liked it. It was, mm -hmm. it was more in the sense, you know, of, you know, kind of just claiming, listen, you know, everybody else was worried about me scoring, but I wasn't. And I'm like, okay, Martin. I love that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, listen, uh, objectively, I hold my hands up. There are times I want you to chill on the shots, but I'm not going to sit here and complain when one of my biggest complaints has been release a final action. A and he's doing it and he's doing it with arrogance. So I'm like, yeah, uh, I, I think that's very important for these kids starting to believe their hype and becoming men. So all in all, good international break. Mm. Brad, what stood out for you? Um on the Tomiyasu chat, I think it would have been very interesting had we not lost Timber as to where his minutes would have come this season. And I wonder whether Timber was brought in to cover left back and invert from the left and cover right back and possibly invert from the right. And we would have only seen Tomiyasu at centre back, possibly, because I, I do think that we've we've massively underrated uh, his ability on in 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 those zones um i didn't get to watch the the england game against scotland so i don't have a lot to say about kind of ramsdale and and his performance uh but i think that if you if you look at the performance from zinchenko in the in in that kind of left center mid role that's that's definitely something we could explore but the one thing that i will say is Zinchenko is always in the midfield. It's basically where he plays anyway. Yeah. It's just where he <laughs> yeah. plays anyway. Yeah. So, so seeing loads of Arsenal fans on Twitter go, "Why can't we play Zinchenko in the midfield?" just proves that Arsenal fans on Twitter don't watch Arsenal because that's just where he fucking is anyway. Like, and I think doing this podcast, especially, I've learned a lot about divorcing the idea of, um, oh, a left back stays at left back and mm. blah 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 blah, and, um. Yeah, it, it, it's been nice to kind of watch watch these players kind of go away and, and do slightly different things. But I don't really pay a lot of stock in internationals. Uh, I kind of just hope our players don't get injured. and They come back fit. The only thing I'll say about England is I think it's um, I'm, I'm really disappointed so far for Eddie Nketiah. And I have no clue what Gareth Southgate learns from giving 31 year old Callum Wilson seven minutes off the bench rather than. Yeah playing Eddie Nketiah and especially because Kane has whilst he's had a good few seasons in terms of injury um, that will catch him up with him eventually when you look at the type of injuries that he's had so England finding a second option at centre forward is probably smart and not giving Eddie a run in friendlies even 15 minutes when mm. you've called him up when he could have you know switched allegiances to Ghana I, I don't see I don't see the thinking, but again, I don't see the thinking in the man 24-7. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of just horses of courses at this point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think the Southgate thing, uh, yeah, I, I've said before, I, I see him more as a kind of a, a statesman. He's I a vibes he's... man. He knows nothing about tactics and football. He, his best season was, what, 10th in the championship with Middlesbrough? Like... Yeah, I, I don't think a top six club would come would come after him. Maybe even top. I don't think club, a, I don't but... think a Premier League club would come after him. Yeah. Genuinely, but I, th I think he what the the work he's done on the culture is kind of you know is 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 great in many ways and 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 has kind of brought an England culture together. But what I will say and what I do feel is that that can happen from a different perspective. Now I think maybe the manager needed to do that for a little while for like four or five years. Now we've got through that and it feels like we have got more of a culture around England now and it feels a bit more together. I think that can then move upstairs and to allow for a more, just a fresh tactical ideas and a fresh tactical mind. Someone who, you know, who is it? Carlo Ancelotti is going to be the Brazil coach. Like he could 100% get a top 10 job in the, in the UK. So I think we've got to start start thinking about it that way. Um, let's move forward to the Everton game this weekend. Uh, George, I'll come back to you first. There's a few different ways of thinking about this. We could obviously think about it in terms of the um, the, the physicality of that midfield, of Anana and Decore and Gay, who's likely to be there in that sort of um, mid-block. Uh, and we can think about Kai Havertz. We could think about the 
likelihood that they're going to be sat off and we're going to have possession possibly and then think about it from a Fabio Vieira perspective you can think about it in t- terms of getting the wingers inside and trying to get Smith Rowe on you know whatever to overlap for Saka you can think about this a number of different ways where do you fall down in terms of the lineup and specifically the midfield because I think that's probably the big sticking point I mean it's it's difficult with the with the entire midfield situation because I feel there is a certain player that's deserved to play. There's also other players, that, not just Fabio Vieira in terms of Trossard, who I believe has deserved to play. And if you're actually purely talking about profile here and not earning to play, if you wanted to give somebody else a go that has not had a chance to, Trossard deserves it more than Fabio Vieira, if we're really being fair. And also, by the way, carries a little bit more of a complete skill set in terms of the pressing, in terms of the out-of-possession quality that you might be losing by replacing Havertz and Vieira. The one issue that I've got is that we're talking about a team that are very big in Sean Dice. It's not just duels. It's not just meeting markers. It's the fact that they've carried a certain physical frame that we've also seen Trissard, again, through no fault of his own. But how did that fare against Fulham, who have a big pair of centre-backs there in terms of his false nine and his duels, right? And, And it's not a fault of, you know, Trossard's ability. It's just, why are you putting him in that situation Mm. to compete with such big uh, people? The same could be said for Fabio Vieira, by the way, who um, I obviously believe quite a bit in. I've talked about how he, I think the misconception on his duels is quite big, but generally speaking, he's not a player that I'm going to be sticking in the middle of the park against Dukure, Onana, and, um, you know, Gay. It's just, it's just not a game where he's going to thrive. And, you know, ideally, we have Partey for this type of match. This is the type of match that you want him for. But yeah. if you don't, yeah. you pick the eight that has the best out of possession qualities for me so that you don't. So at least you have an out ball. The one thing I will say, there is more of a certain um, game state of a low block that you're going to be expecting with this type of midfield. Like, I don't think that Everton are going to be expansive. But again, mm-hmm. go back to last February. What was the game plan? It was to hit Arsenal hard early and hard on a press. Now, I'm going through the team and I'm wondering, Trissard can take care of his own, but Vieira hard against the press with big physical monsters, going to struggle. Like you want him in space. You want him being able to provide a final ball. Um, the other ones in terms of Kai Havertz, look, the one thing that you can say about Kai Havertz is in possession, you're going to be frustrated. But the one thing you can't say is when he is pressed and when he is hit, he doesn't shirk from challenges and he does enter them with quite regularity and he does win a decent amount of them. So that's my I think, only fear. I think I I do worry about that, but I, I wonder whether there's a volume question to be had about like the volume of the press that Everton are going to be able to put us under. I, I can't see them, A, sustaining it, because I think we have the quality to, to play around it, and B, doing anything other really, is that, especially as the game goes on, than sitting further and further back if we can manage to control the game. I think plan A for me would be to control the football, right? And Brad, I'll come to you on this. Like when we go to Goodison, it has historically been a tricky game, but I think we now have the physical, technical and tactical capacity to control the game at Goodison Park, no matter, sort of, no matter who plays, in my opinion. So then I'd rather, because we can control the game, look at it from a much more technical perspective and go right what then then what we're going to be what what questions are we going to be being asked and the questions in my opinion are going to be being asked more with 70 75 percent possession which i i hope we can aim for is those ones that fabio vieira can answer a bit better than let's say a kai habits but to be honest it's it's sort of not about the individuals particularly you can pick a kai habits and still play in a different way kai habits can be asked to do different things it's more about what are we going to be asked to be doing in this game and i don't see everton being able to control the narrative, particularly beyond, let's say, half an hour where they try and come at us, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think Everton so far have been unlucky. At the, and it's borne out kind of statistically that um, that they, they have been unlucky at the start of this season. They battered Fulham and managed to lose that game. They were then massively battered by by Villa, which is kind of really skewed them statistically. But squad basis and kind of statistics basis, that they, should, they shouldn't be in the situation they're in. They should have at least come away. I mean, they're performing, they've, they've created 7.29 XG and they have scored two goals. 
Like mm. they're massively underperforming their numbers right now. They're the biggest un yeah. underperformers in their league. And they've only conceded 6.77 and they've conceded four, five, six, eight goals. So they're, they're kind of underperforming at both metrics at the moment. And unfortunately, that is going to break at some point. A team rarely underperforms across an entire season. But if, if, if we think about what they're good at and what they do, and we think about what Arsenal are good at and what we do, we definitely have the option that as long as we can keep the ball away from them, I don't see them creating that many problems against us, especially when you consider the creation that they've managed has been against Fulham, against Sheffield United, and then little bits against Wolves and against Everton, uh, and against uh, Villa, sorry. So I, this isn't a team that worries me in terms mm. of how they're going to hurt us. I think this is a team that worries me of we're going to face the dice wall. We're going to face that block. And it's always compact and well put together. Yeah. And we need players who can play through it rather yeah. than, for me, physical monsters. I think Kai Havertz is a useful weapon at certain points in this game. Mm. But I don't know whether that useful weapon is going to be as useful as a Fabio Vieira with kind of that lockpick-esque ball yeah. and touch that we might need at certain points than Gabi Jesus at, at centre-forward rather than Trossard, who will cause absolute chaos, which will massively de destabilise that block. Mm. So I I would run with Vieira in the midfield. I, and I think he has earned it, especially with his yeah. cameos in the last few games. But I think you... The risk then is, is you could affect Havertz's confidence, and it, mm. that's already low. But um, so I, it's it's kind of a fifty fifty for me. I think you get you get a weapon with either mm. player. It's just about kind of what weapon you want. I mm. think the one that's going to be most suited for the larger periods of this game is Fabio Vieira, and bringing Havertz on at say 50, 55 minutes to kind of use him as a as a long ball option and as a, a second ball option. Uh, is it would be better tactically, but mm. there's there's kind of a holistic view that we need to take as well of do we stick with Kai Havertz against a team that we think we're likely to beat anyway because mm. on paper they aren't near us in terms of chance creation in terms of most metrics. Mm -hmm. So what what do we do there? I we you know it, Goodison has become a bit of a bogey ground for us. We've got no wins in the last five years there, two draws and three losses. I need us to break that kind of voodoo yeah. because it's just becoming like St. Mary's again. And as we've seen before on teams, mental blocks can, can easily just spring. And I think what would be a good kind of barrier break for this team early on in the season is changing that record. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Think so big moment. A, even if it's a scrappy two, one, just, just breaking mm. that, that duck, breaking that, kind of voodoo and, and getting a win at Goodison, no matter the fact that Everton are, you know, a bit pony at the moment and, and could easily be in the bottom, you know, could go down, though I think statistics have them placed maybe around kind of the 15th mark. Mm -hmm. It's it's a big opportunity for us to do something. And I'm, I'm hoping that the stats don't break against us and they still yeah. underperform and we yeah. overperform. I hope so. I mean, <laughs> they might have a new owner bounce by that point. But yeah, the... Um, the yeah, I... I I sense a narrative forming of like you can't play that player in this game, you can't play this player in this game. I sort of think there's there's just different. We have to ask, in my opinion, as I mentioned, what questions are we being asked? Which players can answer them, and they can answer them in different ways. It doesn't have to be, you know, for example, if we play Kai Havertz, why not play him at centre forward? You know that, that you could argue that's a way. Of, you know, can he be the the target to hit and, and Jesus buzzing around him or, or whatever? You know, I'm not s suggesting that there's one answer i don't think and and i don't know I, I think personally i sit on the on the vieira side obviously georgie sit on the on the uh habit side and, and brad's with uh the vieira thing but again there's there's different ways of looking that as well you could i think you could look at the midfield in a in a totally different way you could try and pack the midfield and let's say you know let's try and play through them centrally so you know there's i think there's different ways but i i, I think it just currently in the method that we're using you could even use declan rice further forward which which could be is an option. So the th the thing is right. Um, I, when we talk about balance being an issue, just generally, there's many iterations that can work. I, I don't think that there's one player for one game, and 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 you know that you should be black and white about really any iteration. I'm very open to kind of any combination of players. I just wonder 
like looking back at last February, what was the demand? And, and mm. I think I'm trying to pick players that I think are up for a pressing fight and willing to be hit mm. and willing to carry on with the contact and not be pushed out of a game. Like what was one of, although Fabio Vieira has been, for example, a lot more aggressive in a lot of his actions and possession, what was one of the things that really put him out of games last season, this season, and pretty much his entire career, and it was being hit. And like, it's understandable because it's frame. But I think even, I think Trossard is more resilient to those kind of contacts in general. Like he deals with it quite well. And he rides contact quite well. Mm -hmm. So if, if you were really willing to see maybe a different aspect in that eight role, I'd be more willing to see him. But I do worry about being hit. I think Everton are going to come to kick us off the pitch. I think that mm -hmm. they're going to come to squeeze space. And I think that although it's a low block, I think they're going to be very high pressing. And even when they did it kind of last February, it wasn't a high press in the sense that you go into their first third. They're going to have a mid block and they're just going to deny space in the center of the pitch. And they're going to be really diligent about hitting our wingers hard and early. So I'm, I'm just worried about that. And, mm. um, but look, if, if we play Fabio Vera, I'm not going to be upset. I get to say, yay, my boy's playing. <laughs> I might get to be fuming about my agenda being in tatters. Yeah, Rubbish. Uh, what does that teach you, Alex? About your, uh, about your agendas? Have more agendas, I think. I think that's what that says. I think that says have as many agendas as possible as you can. And sack it is awful. Uh, Brad, we'll see you. Oh, after this. Oh, I didn't bring it up. Here it is. Pretty good. Back Can't get it out, boys. Welcome back, and thank you to those of you who are in the Different Knock Members Club. If you'd like ad-free versions of this show, as well as the Patreon-exclusive The Instant Reaction Podcast, you become a TDK member at patreon.com forward slash diffknock. You also get access to the exclusive Discord server, the Tactics Corner, the Rewatch, and bonus video content, all for just £3 a month. Or there's a seven-day free trial. All video content is available through YouTube as well. And for once I support, head to buymeacoffee.com forward slash diffknock. You can buy me a coffee. Lovely. The links are in the show description. Right. Questions, boys. Has anyone got one or shall I pick one first? Oh, we had a question from Tom underscore Watson who said, we had Mike Gate with George, but is Brad <laughs> ever getting that mic back? And if not, can he be forced to get a new one? Currently, Audacity is still running. It's still working. So I think we're all good. You should be hearing my voice crystal clear, my friend. Good stuff. Before we get back to more current, maybe, affairs, we've got a question from Leeds Gunner. Not Lee Gunner. Ooh. Leeds Gunner. And Leeds Gunner has said, if Arteta finishes his managerial career at Arsenal with a Champions League, does he eclipse Wenger's legacy because he did what Wenger couldn't do? No. No, because I think you have to look at between 2008 and 2018, Arsenal made a profit of 30 million pounds on players. As in across 10 years, bearing in mind the fees that we were being spending, you know, and the fact and, and the issues with the stadium. I don't think there's a single manager out there that could have achieved what Arsene Wenger achieved. Keeping if if Arsenal fell out of the Champions League during those years and were unable to get back in, there's there's a there's a real timeline that financially really has a big big impact on this club, and we could be much much closer to being a bottom of the Premier League team rather than a you know top of the Premier League team. Mm. You, look, you, as much as I, I would respect what Arteta has done, and I think that he would have done a magnificent job if he wins a Premier League and he wins a Champions League, of course, and that would write him into the folklore of the club forever. But I think that it is going to take somebody. I don't think I don't think what Arsene Wenger did for Arsenal could ever be repeated. I really don't. And that's that's even taking away his achievements of, of winning an Invincibles Premier League and winning three Premier Leagues and, and winning eight FA Cups and all of these things. We spent no money. If you look at the, um, the, the top, I think it's the we're not in the top 20 clubs, I think, for spend or it might be 15 for spend mm. in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, he obviously did an incredible job post Emirates. I, I think it's more it's more the legacy, really, isn't it? Like, you know, the the legacy of what he's the Emirates, the legacy of the the ethos of the club, the legacy of the values. Like, I think that always goes beyond for me personally. Arsene Wenger, yeah, Arsene Wenger's success is what bought the Emirates. 
his sacrifice of personal success is what bore the Emirates. Because if we'd have stayed at Highbury and we'd have continued to be able to fight as a, as a force on the financial front, I have no doubt that he would be much more decorated in terms of medals and titles and trophies. Mm. And he probably would have left and gone to Real Madrid in 2007 or whenever it was, mm. you know, having won more. But mm. he sacrificed his own personal success to grow the club. That that is something that I don't think, and especially to the to the success level that he did do it, I don't think that's something that could ever be repeated. That's mm. like once in 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 a history type moment, like yeah. F- Ferguson winning thirteen Premier Leagues. I don't think that will happen again. Mm. And I'm not sure a modern manager has the opportunity to do that now. Like I think I think the Premier League has come so far that there's kind of not you can't almost can't be a, not necessarily you can't be a trailblazer. You can do certain things, but you can't everyone's a smart club now. Do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not, there's not one or there's two. There's more money now as well. And there's more money. Yeah. Look, I, I think there's a lot to, to the Wenger legacy and I am biased. I'm going to lay it out right now because he's my footballing icon and my mentor. And I just don't think that there's ever any, me. yeah, <laughs> there's never going to be anybody that I think I look up to more as a person to view football. So that's, yeah, awesome, Brad. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like the praise I'm going to start with in this, but objectively let's let's think about what Wenger did and he did so much more than this but achievement wise he has to do something in football Mikel that is that's never been done before and that is a legacy I don't think winning the Champions League is that it's definitely a trophy that Wenger has never won but you know the Invincibles is something that you know Arsenal have never done and of course that a lot of football hasn't done and so while it would be good for Arsenal it doesn't carry the same gravitas to the greater footballing community it just boosts the inner arsenal debates about you know uh who's bigger <laughs> by just winning all of the trophies so i i don't think that he he would have to he would have to do something that would make a statement to the global footballing fraternity and win multiple yeah. trophies along the line and change the game in terms of fitness and nutrition yeah, in terms yeah. of how people are viewed and do the change, the game, isn't, change isn't the game in, in how it's played you know yeah. not only yeah, did he no change the secrets the, anymore yeah no like, and change the identity of Arsenal as a whole, like recognizing Wenger ball. Like a lot of the reason mm-hmm. that Arsenal are followed so dearly is the way we play football. And mm-hmm. that feeling that we've generated over years of playing football the right way is a huge part and fabric of our club. Now, Mikel is doing these things. It's not that he's not doing these things. Well, people are yelling in their mics at me, but there was so much innovative capacity to what Wenger did in general that I really think if you're going to be fair about it, Mikel can certainly reach the achievements that Wenger reached, but can he ever reach the same global impact? That's something that I'll always doubt. But again, that's personal bias, and I'm willing to put admit that. Mm. Yeah, I just I can't help but feel no modern manager like you. You can't. What What are you going to revolutionize? Like the data revolution is. You could argue has happened. Maybe you could argue is happening. Either way, it's hap- It's there's something there. Nutrition, sports science. I, I think there's going to be incremental increases. I, I just can't see a massive. I can't. I don't see an opportunity. And maybe this is you know before it happens. Obviously, you never see it coming. But I don't see an opportunity for a manager to revolutionize the game in a way right. that an Arsene Wenger did. Like I just can't. And so so to... then, sorry. So then, so then you can't compare them. I think you just have to look at. Maybe you could argue that Arteta has a harder job than Wenger. And maybe maybe one or two league titles is a bigger achievement. Like I think that's a decent argument to say because of the competition. You could you could oh, I, I, I could don't know. For that. United United, like if you look at the way that they spent financially, it's comparable to City during those those but, those rivalry years. Fine. You if you adjust for inflation, but it's not just United to my point. You've got City, yeah. Liverpool, Chelsea, Brighton now, Newcastle. My, my opposite like, all... argument to that would be that Wenger couldn't spend any money. Wenger, for years, had kind of a shackle round his ankle. I think that was post the era that I'm talking about, though. I think post oh, yeah, 2006, yeah. I hear you. But I think before that, he was, you know, he was spending money on players. And if you adjust for inflation, he, you know, he never, he was never a massive spender. But I think the, the, the bigger thing for me is about the competition. Like, and this is another thing about like fan expectations of like, we should be winning leagues and competing every single year. And I'm like, well, hang on a minute. Yes, maybe you should when there was three people who could realistically win the league. Now there's 12. <laughs> like, calm down. Like, you know, there's, we've got to consider that the league has changed. Brad, your the question, one please. One final thing that I would say okay. on that is, is you have to also understand that Arsene Wenger was in charge of Arsenal for about 16.5% of Arsenal's history. 
Shit. of Arsenal's yeah, entire yeah. history. 16 and a half percent of Arsenal's entire history had Wenger at the helm. Like that's yeah. that's something that will never be replicated. That number yeah. will get smaller as time goes on, but that that portion will always be large. Um yeah. my question is oh and I've reached my time limit on X. Let's get that back open. Oh. My question is from at AFC underscore KJ. Who is James Hilson? And what about this Cedric fellow? Why would Arteta <laughs> add these mystery men to our Champions League squad? I thought it'd just be a good opportunity to, to chat about, you know, the Champions League squad being announced. Obviously, the fact that Cedric, a, a, a likened to a cockroach, could seemingly survive a nuclear blast and will be the last person standing at Arsenal when he's 46 years old and still on 75 grand a week. <laughs> yeah, he's finessed um, another six contracts. Fucking hell. Uh. Um, but yeah, James Hilson is, is you know, you have to register three goalkeepers in the, in the Champions League. Arsenal's third choice keeper for the season. Um, that's all I really know. But uh, have you guys got any thoughts on the Champions League squads? Any any youngsters? Because we've obviously seen Lino Sosa included, but any admitted that you would have thought should have gone? Yeah, George, well, there was a thing about the, the registration that you, you brought up. That was a good point. Yeah, it's just um, Lino Sousa. The only reason he's being registered is because he's not allowed to be eligible for U21 status until December. So a lot of the people like Ruel Walters, Mario Cozier, Dewberry, they can be part of the B list of the Champions League because they're already old enough to be considered U21s. And so it, it would be more of a case if you're kind of 18 or younger, you would need to be registered as an adult or senior Um it, it, depending kind of on your birthday. So it's more of a technicality issue. Look, um, probably be upset that Miles Lewis Skelly and Ethan Winnery can't really participate in that aspect. Um, they're just too young, or you would have to take up space. And I mean, I don't think they're ever going to take away Mohamed El Neni and, um, you know, Cedric Suarez, even though I would, um, for those two players to, mm. to have an option in there. Um, but I, I think generally with it, I'm happy with the inclusions, generally speaking. Uh, I'm annoyed at the two names that I've mentioned, uh, but that's just a reality until we get them to move on. You know what I mean? And I think by the end of this season, it's guaranteed three of those spots are open. And the one thing I do when I look at those Champions League spots are how do we improve and what spots are left next season? And like I said, three spots are going to be opened um, next season for it. So I'm already thinking, who can I replace within that Champions League squad that I think um, deserves a spot, but also feasibly can, you know, it can be considered an option, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't want to fill it with youngsters. And I think you shouldn't have basically had the opportunity to make Lino Sousa a senior call up. Like, you know, it, it, it's kind of a case of we're, we are filling a spot and mm -hmm. we need it because we don't know whether or not we might need Lino Sousa down the line. But then again, we also can redo this in January too. That's another thing. These squads aren't final. They're only final up until yeah. December. And then you, you can, can replace them. three players. You can replace Ex three players in your squad. Exactly. Hmm. So I, I'd imagine Timber would be replaced by, you know, Lino Sousa, yeah. for example. So I wanted to come on to that briefly before we get a question from you, George. Do we see Timber playing any role this season? Because I think yes. like it's not it's not it's really not something that people are considering right now, but especially in the run in, I can I can see it happening. Like how many times well, have we seen yeah. Kevin De Bruyne miraculously recover within about two days? This is the thing, isn't it? I, that's the, one of the reasons I wanted to ask this question is the conversation that I was really, really surprised to see Timber selected. He's not selected. Is he not? I thought he was. No, he's not. No. Oh, well, then that makes me the, completely the, stupid. Pretty he, can come back in, he can come back in January. Oh, OK. OK. That might have been what you got confused about. But yeah, it, it, essentially, do you think he could be back by February, March? I don't know. It's an ACL, isn't it? Like it's a it's a big old injury. It could be. I mean, I think it depends what the situation is in terms of, um, in terms of where we are in the title race, in terms of where we are in the Champions League race. If we're going deep in both, then and and he's getting back to fitness. I could see him picking up a few minutes. But say, for example, we we drop out of the Champions League to a respectable opponent in the in the quarterfinals, and all we've got left to play for is the league. I wouldn't see when we if if there are no other um, significant injuries, I wouldn't see why we'd rush him back to play mm. significant minutes in the run in when we could give him the rest of that season to recover and then the off season to recover and have another full preseason to get him back up to where he was at the start of this season. Mm. Yeah, 
I hear I hear that. George, your thoughts? I I don't I don't know how I feel about it. I'll be I'll be honest. Um I mean It's possible. Like I don't I don't think it's out of the question. We've and also he's a young guy, he seems seemingly has the right attitude, like Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, th- I, th- I think I think I think with Timber, like I, I, I can, I can, I my what's the word? My optimism, the optimist in me is like, it's going to happen, and I can, and I almost like immediately when it happened, I think part of my like protection mechanism was like, yeah, yeah, but he'll be back by March. It's actually fine. It's actually if actually if anything, it's, it's it's a good time. We'll have a boost. Like it was just me trying to be positive, but no, no, but like I think it's a hundred percent certain that he comes back this season. Yeah, yeah I, I think he tell- will. It's just whether can- he plays a significant role. Well, yeah, and. But I, I think he has to, mate, because like logically, just the timelines match up. Even okay, in the worst case scenario, he's back by the end of March, the end of March. In the absolute worst case, he's got a setback. There's issues with his rehab. He's back in. I'm April. not sure that's worst case. I think worst case scenario would be like he's not back to the end of the season. I think I think March is a well, is a decent case scenario. No, well, I mean, in, given the injury, right? Like he's going to be back in six months, especially because it's only an ACL. That it's that's six, like the rehab timeline. Six line. two nine, though, is my point. Six two nine months. I like, and, and, and most professional footballers, I appreciate come back in six, but like you just the worst case scenario is what I'm saying. Well, yeah, I mean, nine would happen if there was another injury. Mm-hmm. Let's say, like on the rehab, he's come back and he tears a hamstring, mm-hmm. or. There's something like that. Like the actual rehab of the ACL is more of the six. The reason people do six to nine is because you're like, well, what happens if he comes back and he tears a hamstring, a grade two, or he does, he, he comes back and maybe the opposite ankle has a calf strain, which mm-hmm. can happen, you know, when you're coming back from big injuries. But look, even in the nine scenario, I mean, that puts him in May. And I think that we will be able to see him because we're going to be in deep competitions by that point. The question is, do you see him come back to the same level? Those are totally different conversations. And so whether he comes back between March, April, May, even February, Mm -hmm. the time doesn't really matter to me about when. It's the degree of readiness that he comes back Mm -hmm. with. And I think that's the big question that a lot of people have. Are we writing off this season in general? Because even if he was to come back early, is he not the same player in terms of needing a little bit more rhythm, which is understandable. He's had a big injury, but does he come back the same way? Yeah. Those are more interesting questions. I, I I do think broadly, he's the type of individual that when you start to look at mentality as a big predictor for rehab success, mm. and he's got all of the best mentality. So I just think I'm confident, call it optimistic. I think that we will see him again this season. And I predict that we actually see him at a very good level. And I just do it based on not just the player, but our record, again, I made this point earlier, but Jordan Reese, in terms of our physio department, has had an excellent record of bringing people back to the same level or sharpness that they were pre-injury. And it goes beyond different injuries, by the way. Like, he's done it. Look, Partey's been injured, but he, when he comes back, he comes back fine. Mm-hmm. When you look at it, Tommy Asu has come back brilliantly. Saliba, from his back injury, has come back brilliantly. Gabriel Jesus, from his knee issues, has come back brilliantly twice now. So it's I'm confident in the physio's team ability to get him there. Um, but there's just too many unknowns in a rehab that you can't be black and white about it. Like you've got mm. to accept multiple possibilities. And I wonder whether, and George, I'll come to you for your question just in a second. So get it, get it prepped. Um, I, got it. I just also wonder whether in terms of the way he plays, the sharpness of his actions, we might see, you know, if like, I'm not saying a midfielder, you know, there's, there's, there's different problems in, in, you know, wingers maybe they lose a bit of pace or you know they've they've they struggle to ride contact or, or whatever but like i don't know for example like a goalkeeper i feel like has more space on the pitch to come back from an injury if that makes sense like they're not under contact they're not like they're, they're going to be doing predictable actions mostly whereas like i think there's there's a lot more twisting and turning for certain players and i think specifically with timber the way he plays the sharpness of his actions i worry that we're going to not see that level straight away so yeah uh george your question Yes, so this comes from, I guess this is a two-part question, but the Arsenal Bros podcast, when and how will Emil Smith-Rowe get any minutes? And Moheba, I butchered that, I'm so sorry, but Havertz and Odegaard, really Havertz and Odegaard switching places and how would that work? Oh, we Tommy get it, George. <laughs> I'm tired of asking together. one question, George, not two. <laughs> I'm no, tired it's, of it's, it's, it's George. Related. 
it's this it's this Havertz Erdegaard. Just just go for it. Go on. No, like I mean, uh, I, I'm gonna take I, the headphones off. I'm not even gonna listen because I've heard it about 15 times. Just no, I'm gonna I'm, it, done I'm gonna keep it short and brief. The way that Emil Smith Rowe has a role in this team is if Mikel is able to integrate him. Simple, because if we're talking about ways that Emil Smith Rowe fits in this team, he fit, I'm tired about talking how well he can fit. I do really push back on this idea. If we all agree that accessing the middle of the pitch is something that Arsenal have struggled with this season, and then broadly. Forget what you believe on Emil Smith Rowe, but what is his profile? He's somebody that is able to turn quickly in half spaces, drive the tempo of a team, and access the center. I think nobody can disagree with that assessment of Emil Smith Rowe, no matter the quality. I really struggle to understand why a coach wouldn't want to employ that solution when your problem is accessing the center. That's the one thing I'll say. Now, it's the coach's prerogative. He could be seeing things that were not seen in training. I'm open to all of these suggestions, but just from the outside, if you are that insistent on freezing him out, having zero minutes, zero, in his last start since May 2022, I'm very confused why this summer you made such an adamant point that he's staying. Because that was communicated. With the same degree that people thought that he was leaving, there was the same fervent, no, Emil, you're not leaving. I believe in you. You're in my plans. Like, that's a very strong statement to have. And I just don't understand how you can kind of look past that conversation when you had the opportunity to cut ties. Like if you weren't that concerned, surely at the start of the season, when that was a topic, you would have that conversation, right? So that's the first thing for me. Again, this entire switching of the interior eights basically comes down to winger compliments. And I'm not going to go too much more into it than this. When you look at Martinelli as a left winger, he's a touchline winger. I believe that you need to have a passing profile eight that opens up the angles for him, not just on reverse passes, but passes to run into on the same foot, on the strong side that is able to finish far post. That, for me, is really important. And more so, it's the fact that when you've got too many runners in a particular zone, they overlap. When you've got too many instincts in a particular zone, they overlap and they cancel each other out. Not that they're bad players, not that they're not able to do it, but that they end up doing the same things, and then you end up having a predictable pattern of play. And so when you're on the right, you're looking at Bakayo Saka as somebody who's more ball to feet, who is a little bit more patient, who is a little bit more creative on the ball. And you're looking at a midfield who ideally could supplement that by providing some of the off the ball runs that while Bakayo can do, he's not something that he loves doing. And mm. so that brings your Emil Smith Rose, your Kai Havertz, those type of players that are the space invaders opening as a potential complement on the right. And that's where that comes down into. So if you're asking, could Emil Smith Rowe also play a role as the left central midfielder eight as a ball to feet player? Of course he could. I don't think it's where he's best, but of course he could. But again, you need to assume then that Mikel is totally happy with using him. And that's just something that for all my belief in Emil Smith Rowe, I can't ignore the fact that he hasn't been played. And yeah. it's frustrating. I think the next seven to eight game block is going to be telling I don't know what you guys think because I know Alex, like you're somebody that isn't as high on him as I am, but are you not confused with like the messaging from the club at the very least? Like I could admit yeah, uh, that yeah. maybe Mikel is not a fan, but then why would you be so adamant to keep him? There's something going on that we don't know publicly. I'm, yeah. almo I'm almost certain. For sure. Yeah, but there might not be. There's only been, I think the thing is as well, there's only been four <laughs> games played. Like, as, as in, it's just as likely that there's nothing going on as that there is. As in, we have no more information on that. And I think if there was something going on behind the scenes that would have meant that, that that's been causing an issue that isn't, say, an injury or a, a, like a fitness problem, or maybe like we don't talk about it a lot, but like a, a mental health problem, mm -hmm. then I, I think I, I struggle to see if it, if it wasn't something that's either an injury or like a mental health problem that's that's kind of meant that we're taking it easy with Emil and, and mm -hmm. kind of getting him back into the fray, why he wasn't sold in the summer and why there has been such fervent information from the club that we are keeping him, we believe in him, he is in the plans. One thing I will say is like there is there's been four games this season. Like I think it's too early to judge why no player is getting minutes when every single player that's been fit... Plus, we're trying to figure out a new system. And I think with the kind of mind that Mikel has, he's more likely to try and tinker with this plan, try and fix this plan, 
and see if this plan works before then going, oh, okay, now let's introduce new cogs into the plan and let's see how it works. We saw that last season. We basically had a 1-11 to that played every single minute and that's why Emile Smith-Rowe mm -hmm. couldn't get on the pitch last season. And now we look at this season, he's gone, okay, I've ripped it up. I've got a complete new idea. I want to fix this figure this out, get this to work, and then we can start playing with the the extra weapons that I have, mm -hmm. you know, in, in I, the squad. I hear, I hear that, and, and I think that's possible. I just, and, and to be clear, when I say there's something that we don't know, I'm not saying that's always a bad thing. That doesn't necessarily have to be they've fallen out or whatever. I'm just saying there's something we don't know. That's what I think. And I, and, and whether it's Mikel is training him, you know, there's always that like, oh, they're, they're training Martinelli to be a centre forward. Like, there's always something. But like, Maybe he's training to a new position or they're building his fitness. I don't know what it is, but what I'm saying is I think there's something we don't know. It's possible that there isn't absolutely anything and it's just been four games and Mikel's tinkering and I hear that. But my opinion is that I'm pretty sure there is something we don't know because I just think in terms of the, the our, our problems on the pitch at the moment feel like they could... You could you could make two arguments. You could say, well, that's that's a really bad time for Millsmith Rogue when the centre's packed or whatever, which is is probably slightly where I fall down. But there is another side of the argument, which I hear as well, which is you want someone who can combine centrally. You want someone who can create some space, make those third man mm -hmm. runs, drift out wide, get Saka inside. So so I, I, I hear both sides. I just think the fact that we have, and also the fact that, you know, he hasn't started, when do we find out? He hasn't started a game since like that May Newcastle 2022 game. Yeah. Like that is crazy to me. He had a big that, injury last season. I appreciate that, and look, you know that he went that had that surgery and all sorts of stuff, and you know you could you could definitely plot a path that says it's just been injury and fitness and bad luck or whatever. But I think when at some point when a player who you gave the number ten shirt to hasn't started since May twenty twenty two, I think we have to start asking different questions and saying what. What what is it? Because it can't just be the usual. Well, maybe it's a tactical thing. In my opinion, I, I think, think now point, is the might time be to ask the know. question because we are tinkering. As in, I don't think we can look at last season and go, "Why wasn't he starting?" Because who's he going to start over? A player that matched the non-penalty goal contributions from midfield, the stalwart of the team, who was our leader on the pitch, or our left winger that got the joint most goals ever scored by a Brazilian in the Premier League. You know, I, I like those three positions. You, you, when you, when he's coming back to fitness and he's then competing with those three players for the mm -hmm. spots that he'd be competing in, none of us would have swapped any of those players out to start for Emil Smith Rowe. I don't think. No, but maybe they could have got minutes. It doesn't, you know, and and, and he did and, get and, minutes. Um, he did get minutes. Not very many. Yeah, he's in lot, back to fitness, but he got minutes. Season. This season, I, I, I thought there's you were been this four season, games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, only time will tell. We'll either look back and say, oh, all the signs were there, or, well, it was always, you know... It was we'll always be right either field. way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, that's what I'm saying. So it's it's hard to say. Uh, Brad, we have just... Oh, have we? Um, uh, just, uh, just about. Uh, yeah, okay. I well, think... um, yeah, we've, no, we've got time. We've got time. Just got time for a little bit of Arsenal trivia. So the question I asked last week was, Arsenal recently had four players called up to the England men's national team. When was the last time that happened? So I think it was I think it was more recent than we think. <laughs> Do you? I think what are you thinking? I think that I for some reason I have like early 2022 in my head. For Smith, like Smith Rowe, Ramsdale, Saka, and someone else. Who would it have been? And White. That's actually not a bad shout. I mean, that's because I, I remember them being called up, and that can't have been that long ago. I mean, before then, there would have been like, what, like March 2005 or something? <laughs> no, no, no. But what about the period with like Oxley Chamberlain, um, Kieran Gibbs, Jack Wilshire? Oh, yeah. There must have been a period in like 2010, 2011. Yeah. Yeah. When did Ooh. they all sign that? What was was Gibbs in the England team? Was he? I swear he had a call up at some point. We've all had a call up at some point, mate. <laughs> um, Darius Vassell had a call up. Um, okay. My gut is that we, because Ben White, I thought like he's had an issue with the camp, right? Like I know Ramsdale's been always a yeah, part but of that was the Yeah, but that was the Euros. No, that so was the World Cup. 21. That was the World Cup. He got sent oh, home the from World the World Cup. Cup. Yeah. So, 
I just don't know if they've all fallen on the same time. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit older. I'm going to go 2011. I'm going March 2022. I've got a feeling. One of you is correct. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And it is Alex. Oh, March 2022. Yeah, with the exact four players you were talking about, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I had a feeling. We're called up to the squad just before, um, you know. That was, I think that was Smith Rowe's only senior call up before injury. I feel like I might wow. have seen that somewhere recently, but I can't remember where. Like, sub- you know, when, like sub- subconsciously, maybe. I can't remember, but Twister. subconsciously. Good call. <laughs> Damn. Decent. Decent. And next week? Next week, well, I didn't get a theme. I keep forgetting to ask for a theme. You need so to one, ask. <laughs> one of you quickly, quickly think of a theme while I pull a question out of my ass. Um, um, how about how many? How many? Wait, the question for next okay. week: How many current internationals do Arsenal have in their squad? How many players do they have in their squad that are current, fully fledged internationals? Players that have played at least three games. For their country. Okay. Like cameos as well included? Yeah, because there's no way I'm going to search every single Arsenal player for... Three for, appearances. For three, the, how for many the of team. the current 25 have three appearances for the national team? Okay. Wow. And would you like a theme, Bradley? Please give me a theme that I can write down <laughs> for next week. Uh, give me Arsenal in the community. Ooh, that's oh, nice. What a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the community. Lovely. Uh, pleasure as always, gents. Always. Can't like... wait for the footy to come back. Oh, Bloody hell. This international break has felt two. so long. Yeah, it's been really shit. It's felt so long, especially because of Southgate ball. <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. And all this stupid stuff. And... Oh, F- Foden. Foden doesn't play in the centre of midfield for his club. And then the... he goes and starts Trippier at left back. And James Madison at left wing. So it's just, yeah, it's... Yeah. Idiot. Idiot. Southgate, you're a prat. <laughs> yes, you are a twat. Football nah, 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 nah. again. <laughs> Pleasure as always, gents. Thanks for watching yeah. and listening to the Different Knock. Keep it Different Knock. And we will see you later. Later. Bye. Peace. Let me say peace, George. Peace.